Looking forward to today. We are jumping into week two of a seven week emphasis and series on prayer as we walk through the Lord's Prayer uh, together. Really been looking forward to this. Um, I mentioned last Sunday that this series, uh, which is more than just a sermon series, it's a real emphasis that our small groups are going through a study together, daily devotions we put together, a book you can pick up in the foyer that will direct you through all of that. But the, the focus of all of this very simply is that ultimately we would grow our prayer life so that we can mature and grow our spiritual life. Because you really cannot grow your faith in Christ and mature as a believer without a prayer life that also grows and prays the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Um, and we said last week that the reason this is so important to really understand the way Jesus taught us how to pray is because um, we, we saw this last week, that most people pray. I mentioned this last Sunday, right? Most people pray at some point in their life um, about something, even the most uh, quote-unquote irreligious person that maybe you know that would not really claim to, to follow Christ or to even uh, believe in God all that much. There is a, a point in most everybody's life that something happens and something goes on and they're driven to pray or to ask you to pray for them. Most people pray. The problem isn't that we pray. The problem is that most of us pray with an understanding of prayer that is immature and incomplete. Uh, we, we just think about it in, in a way that is immature or approach it in a way that's truly incomplete. Point in case, I mean, we've all prayed that that police officer did not actually see us speeding, right? I don't know that that's how Jesus taught us to pray, but we've all prayed for that. Um, if you were, when you were in school, you probably prayed that you would pass a test you didn't really study and prepare all that much for. Um, some of us might need to think back a few years to those days, right? Um, I said last Sunday, we all pray. We, we always pray for our meals, right? God bless this food to our bodies. That bacon double cheeseburger and large shake to the nourishment of my body. We pray those things, right? Um, and and, and we, apparently, too, this past week, uh, Gator fans and Seminole fans were all praying <laughs> because both teams finally won a football game. Although the Gators won by a much larger margin, so apparently Gator fans prayed harder. Um, that's what I'm taking away from that. Anyway, uh, but we all pray, but we often pray with an understanding of prayer that's immature and it's incomplete. And recognizing that they had an understanding of prayer that was incomplete, the disciples once asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. We, again, we looked at this last week. I just want to real quick review this. Luke chapter 1 says that Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished praying, one of the disciples came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught the disciples to pray. So Jesus, there's something about the way you pray. There's something about the way you talk to the Father that's different than the way we pray and talk to the Father. We know John's disciples had the same issue. He taught them, would you also teach us? And Luke's gospel I mentioned last week records the Lord's Prayer, an abbreviated version of it. There's a much longer version in Matthew chapter 6, which is what we're going to use for this series over the next several weeks. But before Jesus taught them to pray in Matthew 6, where we have the record of the Lord's Prayer there, um, before he taught them how to pray, he actually backed up and he addressed what apparently was the root cause of them wrestling with how to pray. There was something else that Jesus wanted to teach them and show them that prayer was just one bigger part of that. Here's what I mean. Here's what he said in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, in response to this question, he said, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Because you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven if that's your goal, practicing your righteousness just to be seen. Now this phrase, practicing righteousness, what it literally means when you delve into how this was written, it's this idea of how to express your faith outwardly. That's what he means by that. It's not just you know, like, like you play a sport, it's not just practice basketball practice to prepare for the game of basketball. That's not the kind of practice he's referring to. He's referring to the outward expression of. This is the way I engage, I, I practice, I outwardly express what I believe to be true about God. Here's how I express my righteousness. And Jesus' caution is, be careful not to express what God's done in your life just in a way to be seen by other people. Because if you're only expressing your faith outwardly to be seen by other people, there's no benefit to that. And there's certainly no way that your Heavenly Father is going to bless that. So part of the way we express our, our, our faith through Christ, apparently, is also the way that we pray. Now, he gives a couple warnings of how not to express this before he tells them how. 
So let's look at that first. Verse three, verse five, I should say, he says this. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. They love to pray at the street corners that they can be seen by other people. And here's his caution on that. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. There's nothing more they have to gain than being seen and noticed by other people. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door that your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then he says this, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for the many words, but instead do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him. So Jesus says there's some ways you should and should not practice righteousness. And the first thing he says is here's how you should not practice that and how you should not pray. Do not practice righteousness or pray in order to be praised by people to be seen by other people, or just to sound spiritual. That's not the motive behind praying. Um, it really doesn't matter what people think or see or how you sound to them. Um, you'll receive your reward in full. And then that, that verse we just read, that last phrase that I read, says that your father already knows what you need before you even ask him. I mentioned last week that today we were going to delve more into that statement. Why, If that is true, if before you and I ever ask God for anything, God already knows what we need, and he already knows what we're going to ask before we even ask, then here's the question you have to wrestle with. Why do we pray? Why bother? And certainly, why does it matter how we pray if God already knows what we need in the first place? Does it, does it matter? In your, uh, if you're going in one of our life groups, if you're going through the small group study, we gave you a definition, kind of a working definition for the series of prayer in your, in your small group study this week. And I want to give it to all of us today, so in case you're not in the study or just to remind those who've already seen it. For the purpose of this discussion, here's what I want you to consider the purpose of prayer actually is. If our Father knows what we need, so it's obviously not asking Him for what we need, is not the primary purpose. The primary purpose of prayer is this, to realign our life towards God, creating a trust and confidence in His will leading us to fully surrender to God in love. Now, that's a really long definition, a lot longer than I would normally give for something like this, but I really didn't know any better way to say it. But it's important to note the difference of what, according to the Lord's prayer, the purpose of prayer is versus the reason why you and I tend to pray. The most common, we already established last week, the most common reason we all tend to pray, myself as included, is to ask God for what we need. God, I need an answer. God, I want to know your will. Help me make a good decision. Please heal this person who's sick. And, and, and hear me, we're supposed to pray about those things. We're told to ask God for our daily needs. We'll get to that in a few weeks. But for most of us, that's the majority of our prayer life, I think it would be safe to say. Instead, where does the Lord's Prayer start? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. All these other things. And the purpose of prayer is very simply to not inform God of what I need is primarily to realign my life to God's kingdom and God's will. There's never been a moment you ever asked God of anything that the moment you finish praying that he's like, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I don't know how I missed that. He already knows. No, prayer is about God, this, whatever your will is, I'm clear my life doesn't align with that. And in prayer, I want to seek your kingdom first. I want to understand your will, and I want to align my life with who you are. That is the primary purpose of prayer. Now, um, so, so today we're going to jump in and really begin looking at a phrase at a time, the Lord's Prayer. We're going to start with that first one. So let's do this. Let's read it aloud together. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 3. I'm, we're going to read this, and I thought it would be great if we read this aloud together. And, and I did mention last week that nowhere in Scripture are we instructed to pray this, Jesus says, pray like this. So this isn't a, a thing we're supposed to pray all the time, although there's also nothing in Scripture that says it's wrong to pray this word for word. But anyway, this is the model of how to pray, but let's read it aloud together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, as you read through that, there are two 
basic divisions to the Lord's Prayer, if you want to think about it this way. Two kind of main topics that Jesus addresses. The first is praying to God about God. And the second is praying to God about ourselves. But the Lord's Prayer begins with us first praying to God, really, about God. How, uh, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? So in prayer, Jesus is kind of saying, look, you start out by understanding who God is. Acknowledge God's holiness. And when you acknowledge his holiness, you're going to seek his kingdom so that you can surrender to his will. That's where this model prayer begins. Because when we do that, when we acknowledge God's holiness and we seek his kingdom and we surrender to his will, what it does is that it affects and shapes our will and molds our kingdom and creates a holiness in us. That's kind of the purpose of prayer. When we seek God's holiness in his kingdom and his will, it shapes our will, it affects our kingdom and grows our holiness. That's how these two play hand in hand. And what I want to talk about today is how we honor God as holy. Because that's where this prayer begins. All right? What does it mean to honor God as holy? The first part of the prayer that we looked at, right, the first statement, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does that word mean? What does that phrase mean? And how do we do this? Hallowed, this word simply means um, honored, revered, respected, um, it also has this idea of holy, holy is your name, respected is your name, revered is your name. Um, that's what it means, hallowed be your name. Psalm 99 says that we are to exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Respect and honor God because God is holy. So first off, let's do this. Let's define holy. What does it mean truly mean that God is holy. The word holy in the Hebrew, it simply means to be set apart. Something that is sacred, separate, and set apart. That's what that word means. So when we're talking about God's holiness, what we're talking about is God's absolute purity. There is no fault. There is nothing wrong. There is no mistake that God can or has ever made because he is holy. He is right. He is good. He's perfect in every way and good all the time. Now, you and I are called to goodness. One of the fruits of the Spirit is goodness. Part of God working out our salvation in us is that we would do good things. Ephesians 2.10 says that there are good deeds God's prepared in advance for us to do every single day. So we all have done good things. We can do good things. There might even be somebody that you know in your life that you would just refer to them as a good person. You know, you ever said that about somebody like, they're just good people. You know, I've got... I've told you before a story about my great uncle Don um, in his mid 90s uh, in southern Indiana, a farmer, was a mail carrier, great guy, love him to death. Um, he's got Alzheimer's and dementia setting in. He doesn't know as much as he used to, and he's actually living now in an assisted living facility um, in, a, in another town. But if you walk around Salem, Indiana today, and you walk up to many people that have lived there very long, and you mention the, the name Don Morris, chances are they would say, Don is, he is just a great guy. He is, he's a man of his word. He's kind. He's generous. He's a man of integrity. He's just good people. That's what they would say about Don. Um, still do. And they would be right. But here's the thing. No matter how good that person is or you are or any of us ever are, the fact that God is holy and set apart, what it means is that on our best day, our goodness is not even good compared to God. That's what it means. He's that set apart. Romans goes so far as to say, compared to God's goodness and holiness, none of us has even done anything good compared to how good God is. He is that set apart. So here's the question for today. What does it mean to acknowledge that in prayer and to hallow God's name, to respect God's name, to honor God's name as holy? How do we do that? The fact that God is holy, that's one thing. And I could spend an entire message just on that. But I want to spend the rest of our time on how we honor God's name, hallow God's name as holy. And there's a lot of things I could say about that. There's a lot of things the scripture says about that. I want to kind of highlight a couple of them for you today. And here's the first thing that I would say about how you and I respect and honor God's name is that we honor God publicly. We honor him publicly. That's one of the ways we hallow God's name as holy. Acknowledge it as holy. 
Psalm 101 says that I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord, I will make music. What, that, that's what, th- what this hour is about every Sunday when we gather together, is that it's one way that we publicly can honor God as the people of God. That's one of the purposes of this gathering every week. The people of God have always gathered in public ways t- to recognize him. In fact, when you go into Scripture and you look through Scripture from the beginning all the way to the end, there's example after example of the people of God coming together in a very public, outward way to honor God for who he is, that God is holy. Um, The Old Testament, there are seven different feasts that the Jews were asked to remember each year from Passover in the early spring. Um, You had Passover, you had the Feast of First Fruits, you had Pentecost. Um, later on in the, in the fall, you had things like the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, you have the Day of Atonement. There's seven different feasts that they were to, to gather together, and it involved things like singing together. They would open up. Scripture would be read together. Uh, they would pray together. They would bring offerings together, and all to honor God for who he was. And every one of those feasts had a different reason for honoring God. The Passover was a reminder of how God delivered uh, the Jews or the Hebrews at the time in, in, uh, in Egypt, delivered them from Pharaoh under the Passover lamb. First fruits, they were to bring the first grains of their spring harvest and to honor God with it because ultimately God is the one that provided. Right? The day of atonement, they were sacrifices they would make on behalf of their sins, asking for God's grace and forgiveness, honoring God as the one who forgives. Every one of them was a way to publicly honor God. And so when they gathered, they would sing, they would open scripture together, they would pray, bring offerings and all of that. Very similar to what we do, right? We sing, we bring offerings to God, we open up scripture together. That's why we do it as a way to publicly honor God. We bring people up on on this platform here to play instruments and to sing, to use their talents to to lead us in in, in worship. The reason they come up here, you realize that, right? We don't bring people up here so that you will be impressed by their musical ability. It's not so that you can sit out there and listen to great music and go, wow, they are really good, even though they're pretty good. In fact, we we try to intentionally find people that know how to play instruments and can actually sing to play instruments and sing when they lead us in worship. I know the Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We're grateful some of you make that noise out there without a microphone, right? And that doesn't mean you're bad people. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. You just can't sing. That's fine, right? But I can tell you the people up here that lead us, they're not hoping that you hear them and listen to them and that you're impressed by them. I know, because I know them all, that their goal is they're gonna use these talents that God's given them for one purpose, to help us corporately direct our worship to God that we would honor him for who he is. God, let's direct our worship to you because you are holy. You are set apart. But here's the thing you have to acknowledge and that's really important to understand. The degree to which we honor God publicly is always limited by the degree to which we follow God privately. The degree to which we honor God publicly is limited and determined by the way in which we follow God privately. Throughout Scripture, you find this constant beckoning of God for his people to return their hearts to him. That they would not just sing to him and they would not just bring offerings to him and they would not just offer sacrifices to him, but the call of God continually to his people throughout the Old Testament and even in the New. All of it, it's the same thing because people have always had the same issue. It's bring me your heart, come to me. Yet what you do might be important, but what you do has to be out of who you are. A heart that is fully mine is what I desire most. Psalm 101 goes on to say this in verse two and three, that I will ponder the way that is blameless. So so consider this, before you and I, if, if you and I did this, think about this for a minute. Before you and I came to church, before we brought an offering, before we even opened the word, before we sang songs to God, if you and I spent time pondering, thinking about the ways of God that are blameless, that are holy, He goes on to say, I will walk with integrity of heart. Notice it doesn't say I'm going to walk with integrity just of actions, which is important. But may my integrity of actions come from walking with an integrity of heart. 
I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I will not have, it goes on to say, a perverse heart will be far from me. I will know nothing of, of, of evil. This is all about what's going on inwardly for the person who follows God. And the reason this is so important is because at its core, legalism and self-righteousness is this tendency that all of us have to be okay with our outward life looking one way while our inner relationship with God is something else. Put, it, put another way, we all wrestle with being okay in certain degrees with our heart not matching up with our actions. We've all excused away certain things as, eh, I know, I mean, I'm just not perfect, right? And if you're not careful, where that leads you to is a heart that is not fully God's while on the outside trying to act and pretend as though we are. Remember this, God does not need anything from us. There's nothing I can ever bring him that he is lacking in any way. And so when I bring him my, my worship, when I'm bringing my praise, when I'm bringing my prayers, when I, when I come to him in any way, I'm not coming to him worthy of him in any way, shape, or form. I'm coming to him out of someone who recognizes how far from him I actually am and how grateful I am for who he is. Now, I, I want to show you one more example of this in, in the Old Testament. There, there's a pretty consistent pattern, you probably know this, that the nation of Israel had of, of being fully devoted to God and honoring God with their hearts and then eventually just honoring God with their actions and not their hearts, which eventually would just lead them to be dishonoring to God altogether. And then God would send a prophet and call them to repentance and they would return. It's this cyclical experience that they just kept going through. There, there's one prophet in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets he's referred to. His name is Amos. And God speaks to the prophet Amos at a time in Israel's history where they were really, really good at the external stuff looking good and the inner heart being very far from God. They were doing all the right things. They were checking all the right boxes, but their hearts were very far from God. And here's what God says to his people about all of this worship through the prophet Amos. He says, I despise your feasts and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Now, the feasts he's referring to are those seven feasts I was talking about, Passover and Pentecost and the Day of Atonement and the others. He says, I take no delight in those because I don't need them. They never, ever were for me, okay? They were always a reminder for you and an act of worship for you. They, they, they weren't really for me, even though you offered them to me. So I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. I will not accept them. I will not look upon them. In fact, he goes so far as to say, I would really rather you take away from me the noise of your songs. Because again, I don't need them. He's got angels day and night singing holy, holy, holy to you, O Lord, right? I don't need what you're bringing. I enjoy it when it comes from a heart that is fully mine, but I don't need them. I'd rather you take them away. But here's what I would prefer. Here's what I want from you more than anything. Go back to that last slide. What I would prefer is justice to roll down. What I prefer is righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What I want from you isn't all these actions. What I want from you is a heart that is seeking me, that is fully mine, that you let me create in you the person that you were made to be in the beginning. To let justice roll down like justice rolls from me and righteousness come like it comes from me. And what I believe God is saying is, is this, that what God desires is for us to honor him publicly because we follow him privately. That's what God's most after for our worship, is that we would honor him publicly because we follow him privately. And what is, when he's your Lord, when he's your God, the way you most respect God, the way you most honor God, is that you value and embody the things that most define him. And what is one of the things that most greatly defines God? That he is holy. I'm going to show you a picture um, that means an awful lot to me. Uh, this is a picture of me with my dad and my grandfather, Papaw, as we call them in southern Indiana. 
That's so my dad's dad and my dad and myself there in the middle. And we're standing on the front porch of my grandfather's childhood home in Kidder, Kentucky. And if you don't know where Kidder, Kentucky is, that's all right, because most people in Kentucky don't know where Kidder, Kentucky is. Population of about 25, um, kind of south of, uh, or north of Knoxville, Tennessee, kind of southeastern Kentucky. But this picture was taken in 1996. Um, I've been married about a year, and we were up there for a family reunion. The house does not belong to anyone in the family anymore, but the people that owned it allowed us to have a family reunion there. They had a bunch of horses that they would allow people to come and do trail rides, and so they kind of rented out the whole space they had. And we had, I don't know, 150 people down there for this family reunion. My grandfather, who's the second oldest child, he's the oldest son, born in 1918. So in that generation, um, his position in the family carried with it a lot of responsibility as the oldest son. Um, and he, uh, I helped him type out a whole bunch of history that he got up and read to everybody. I got to go on a horseback ride that day with my grandfather around the, the farm that he grew up in, one of my all-time favorite memories that I have with him. Um, I was very close to my grandfather. Uh, he, uh, he taught me a lot about what it meant to, to follow Jesus Taught my dad what that, what that meant. He was an elder in our church. He volunteered a lot of different ways. He, when they retired to move to Florida, he um, worked with a local food bank in Leesburg and ran food for them and picked up and took there. They had a son that died when he was 13, my dad's older brother. My dad was 10. And after that, my grandparents kept a lot of foster children. Um, they just gave and they gave and they served. And it wasn't out of obligation and it was never for fanfare or for people to know what they did. It was always out of this private, inward following of Jesus that they did all of these things that they did. And so I learned that from him. About five years after this picture was taken, um, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Before that, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's right after this picture was taken. About five years after this, he was unable to speak and unable to walk, mostly bedridden. And for most of the next, of the eight years that he battled that, my, uh, my dad helped my grandmother take care of him. I remember being over there one day. My dad wasn't there. My grandmother had left with uh, a friend, and well, with her sister-in-law. My grandfather's brother and sister-in-law had come down for a visit, and I stopped by to say hi. And long story short, my grandfather needed help kind of getting cleaned up. And, and his brother was kind of upset. He was starting to go into dementia too. And before I knew it, I was there. I'm changing my grandfather's clothes, and I'm helping um, kind of clean him up and get him in, in, in a presentable way. And as I'm in the middle of changing my grandfather's clothes, I remember thinking I was so glad that he didn't understand the fullness of what I was doing right then. But I was so honored to be able to serve him that way because of who he was. And the things that he taught me about Christ and the things he taught me about loving my family and serving other people and a very private embarrassing, if he knew what was happening, but intimate way that Isaac's grandson was able to serve him that way because I respected him so much. I looked up to him so much. I honored him so much. And it was a moment that I had to be able to serve him without him even knowing I just did it because I loved him. Most of you never met my grandfather But by that very short story I've just told you, hopefully there's a little bit of respect you might have for him and he would deserve that, right? Now, here's why I tell you all of that and why it matters so much that we as Christians approach God as holy. Because when we treat God as less, the world thinks less of God. When the people of God approach God in a way that is flippant and, and selfish and maybe even arrogant, when we treat God as though he is not the, the one that is holy and set apart, how can we ever think that the world would view God with any kind of respect if his people aren't showing him the respect that he deserves. 
I told you one story about my grandfather and who he was and how much I respect him. And from the amount of respect and honor I have from him, there's a chance that you probably have some respect and honor for him, even though you never met him. How much more does our heavenly father deserve us to show him glory and honor and praise? The people that no matter how good we are, our goodness will never come close to his goodness and righteousness and holiness. He is set apart. Hallowed be his name. And to honor him publicly as we should, to gather together as the people of God, to sing praises to him, to honor him for who he is, to give offerings and sacrifices to him, to open up his word so that we can follow him, to do all of that publicly is something we all, I believe, are called to do. But church, my hope and prayer is that everything we ever offer God publicly is because of the place of honor we live with honoring him privately. God, I worship you publicly because I'm amazed and in awe of you privately. I sing songs to you publicly because privately, I'm pondering what it means to be blameless. I'm walking with integrity of heart because of who you are and what you deserve. So pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I... Thank you, Lord, that even though we are a people that will never, ever on our own power have a goodness and righteousness, anything close to yours, and yet, God, you came to us. You sought us and offered us your righteousness. But God, as grateful as we are and as personal of a God as you are, may we never, ever take for granted who you are, that you and you alone are holy. You are set apart. And so God, today we honor you publicly as our holy God. But my prayer is that we would all honor you publicly from a heart that is seeking you fully privately. Thank you for loving us first in Jesus' name.